There have been a number of different laws in Britain to give various organisations the power to use covert surveillance to monitor the activities of individuals and businesses. Here are a few of them. In this computer science lesson, you'll learn about two of these laws in particular. You will learn how the powers to investigate crime are exercised and by whom. You will also learn about the checks and balances that have been put in place to ensure that these investigatory powers aren't abused. The Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, or RIPA for short, came into force on the 26th of July in the year 2000. The Investigatory Powers Act came into force 16 years later, on the 29th of November 2016. The Investigatory Powers Act was intended to define all of the regulations for covert surveillance and data gathering in one act. The Investigatory Powers Act updated and replaced much of RIPA. And the Investigatory Powers Act of 2016 has been amended on several occasions since. If you're a student of computer science, you should be aware of both of these laws. Why do these laws exist? Well, these days, communication systems are a fundamental aspect of our lives. We use them at work. We use them at school. We play with them. And they are essential for staying in touch with friends and family. There are now over 50 billion computers and smart devices connected to the so-called Internet of Things. But as useful as they are to us, these systems also provide a communication network for criminals, terrorists and hostile governments. Indeed, 95% of all serious crime investigations these days involve digital communications data. The power to conduct covert surveillance is a vital tool for the prevention and detection of crime, to protect national security and to protect public health and safety. The objectives of these laws are therefore to enable public authorities to carry out covert surveillance in order to identify and investigate potential threats. More details about who these public authorities are and what is meant by covert surveillance in just a moment. These laws set out the powers available to public authorities. There have to be limits on what public authorities can do and there has to be some regard for people's privacy. After all, even the organisations empowered to govern and protect us are fallible, and they are certainly not above the law. These laws provide transparency. They are spelt out in detail and published so that people can understand how they work and be aware of their rights. It also means that these laws can be scrutinised and challenged if necessary. So, what is meant by covert surveillance? Put simply, it means watching or listening to people or collecting information about them in secret, without their knowledge. In other words, spying on them. Covert surveillance might involve intrusive methods like bugging a house or a workplace with a listening device. Wiretaps to eavesdrop on telephone conversations or monitor internet traffic, for example. The use of video cameras. These days, cameras can be made so small that they can be hidden almost anywhere, and they are practically undetectable. They can even be deployed with unmanned aerial vehicles, drones. Covert surveillance could also include the interception of any form of communication, including letters, parcels, phone calls, email, text, and even social media posts. Covert surveillance even includes the use of informants and undercover agents to follow people. So-called covert human intelligence sources. But it's important to appreciate that not all surveillance is covert and is therefore not subject to the laws that we are talking about here. For example, video cameras in public spaces like shops, car parks, hospitals or schools are not considered to be covert. As long as they are visible and there are signs to inform people that they are in use, then those cameras are not spying on people, as far as the law is concerned. Arguably, anyone who's uncomfortable with CCTV 
can choose to go somewhere else. The same applies to recorded phone calls and website tracking cookies. If you've been made aware that this type of surveillance is taking place, then it's perfectly legal. In fact, and this might surprise you, under British law, if you're in a public place like a town centre or a park or maybe at the beach, then it's perfectly legal for another person to take photos of you, and even children. Because in the eyes of the law, you have chosen to put yourself in a public location, and therefore you cannot reasonably expect any degree of privacy. So who are those organisations with the power to carry out covert surveillance? As you might expect, they include the police and various law enforcement agencies like the National Crime Agency, the Serious Fraud Office and the Independent Police Complaints Commission. They include intelligence services like the Security Service, also known as MI5, the Secret Intelligence Service, that is MI6, and the Government Communications Headquarters, GCHQ. They include a wide range of government departments, like the Department for Transport, the Department for Agriculture and Rural Development, the Department for Trade and Industry, the Department for Work and Pensions, the Department of Health, the Environment Agency, the Financial Conduct Authority, the Food Standards Agency, the Gambling Commission, to name but a few. Also, as you might expect, the taxman. Namely, His Majesty's Revenue and Customs has the power to conduct covert surveillance. But, perhaps surprisingly, over 330 local authorities have some powers of covert surveillance. These local authorities include county councils, district councils and metropolitan boroughs. Under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, Local authorities are only allowed to carry out covert surveillance if their intention is to prevent or detect a crime, and only if that crime carries a prison sentence of at least six months. Having said that, there have been some interesting applications of this power by local authorities in the past. For example, one particular county council put three children and their parents under continuous covert surveillance to check whether they lived in a particular school catchment area. Other county councils have used covert surveillance to monitor breaches of planning regulations, fly tipping, dog fouling and even underage smoking. Here's a summary of the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000. It allows certain public bodies to monitor people's internet activities, that is, to see what they're up to online. It allows certain public bodies to conduct mass surveillance of any form of digital communication. Mass surveillance could mean most of, if not all, of the population. It allows certain public bodies, in particular the police and intelligence services, to demand that internet service providers grant them access to customers' digital communications, without the customer's knowledge or consent. It allows these public bodies to demand that the internet service providers fit equipment to carry out covert surveillance, and at the internet service provider's own expense. It allows certain public bodies to demand that someone reveals the passwords or keys to encrypted information. This particular power is limited to the police, the intelligence services, GCHQ, MI5, MI6, the National Crime Agency and the taxman. Refusal to hand over encryption keys could result in a two-year prison sentence, or five years if national security is threatened. Finally, if a public body has been granted a warrant to perform covert surveillance, they can keep the existence of that warrant and any data collected under that warrant, a secret. They don't even have to reveal it in a court. But a lot has changed since Ripper was enacted. Twitter and Facebook didn't even exist when it came into force. The first iPhone wasn't released until seven years later, and WhatsApp didn't make an appearance until two years after that. Ripper, on its own, soon became unfit for purpose. The Investigatory Powers Act was enacted 16 years after Ripper. 
It restated many of the existing powers and it introduced some new ones. Here are some of the differences. It now refers to communication service providers. This still includes internet service providers as before, but also covers mobile phone companies, cable companies, satellite operators, cloud computing providers, and of course, social media providers. In fact, pretty much anyone that enables digital communication or data storage. The updated law requires that British communication service providers retain the internet connection records of their customers for at least one year. This refers to records of which websites were visited, but not the particular pages that were viewed, and not the full browsing history. Arguably, the connection records are all that you need to incriminate someone. Communication service providers must also hand over this information to the police, the intelligence services, or various government departments, on demand, and without the need for a warrant from a court of law. The Investigatory Powers Act requires that British communication service providers have the ability to undo any encryption that they provide for their customers. They must make sure that they can still see their customers' secret messages. This particular provision means that a communication service provider based in Britain cannot guarantee privacy for their customers. Also, any back door that they put in place for the purpose of law enforcement is a vulnerability that can be exploited by criminals. This section of the law is problematic for a number of other reasons. For example, many messaging services like Apple's iMessage and WhatsApp employ end-to-end -end encryption. With end-to-end -end encryption, a new set of encryption keys is generated automatically for each message. These keys are never kept, so the communication service provider couldn't read a message, even if they wanted to. Furthermore, many of the communication service providers used by British people are not British. This makes the law very difficult, if not impossible, to enforce. Some politicians have suggested organisations that provide end-to-end -end encryption should not be allowed to operate in Britain at all. Yeah, right. The Investigatory Powers Act makes it a criminal offence for a communication service provider or someone who works for a communication service provider to reveal that they've been asked to hand over data. The Investigatory Powers Act allows so-called equipment interference by the police and intelligence services. In other words, they can employ the same techniques used by cybercriminals to hack into computers, phones and other smart devices. Perhaps most controversially, the police and intelligence services are not allowed to conduct covert surveillance of an elected member of parliament, or even an unelected member of the House of Lords. This is known as the Wilson Doctrine, after the former British Prime Minister Harold Wilson. It was previously an unwritten law that government ministers should not be subject to the same kind of scrutiny as any other member of society. But the Investigatory Powers Act now states this explicitly. In 2013, Edward Snowden, a computer consultant working for the USA's National Security Agency, leaked some highly classified information to the media. It showed that the American government, in cooperation with several European governments, was conducting covert surveillance on a global scale. Snowden was charged with theft of government property and espionage, and has since fled to Russia. The Investigatory Powers Act was proposed in the wake of Snowden's revelations. It therefore came in for a lot of criticism, even before it was passed into law. It quickly became known as the Snoopers Charter, because many believed it simply legalised the gross invasions of people's privacy and violations of their human rights that were already happening. But the Investigatory Powers Act did introduce a number of controls. Under Ripper, if an organisation wanted to carry out covert surveillance in the UK, all they needed was the agreement of a government official, namely the Home Secretary. But the Investigatory Powers Act of 2016 appointed the Investigatory Powers Commission, the IPC, a group of senior judges whose job it is to oversee the use of covert surveillance. 
Now, anything authorised by the Home Secretary must also be approved by the IPC, except in emergencies. The Act also established an Investigatory Powers Tribunal to deal with any complaints. Like it or not, covert surveillance is a fact of life in a world driven by information technology. Arguably, we need it to keep us all safe. Perhaps we just need to accept that in a modern society, privacy is too much to ask for. Perhaps all we can do is hope that the lawmakers who have given themselves the power to watch us and have given themselves immunity from being watched don't abuse their power and don't themselves have anything unlawful to hide.